ونسلي ونسلم على رسوله الكريم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. So we're going to continue with the seed of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. If you were here for our Jum'a, the second Jum'a, then we talked about the Masjid, the Masjid of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, the Masjid Nabawi. So if you missed that, don't worry, you can always catch that on YouTube. So all 70 plus lectures um, are available on YouTube, so you can watch them. They're around 20 minutes each, so I've kept them consciously short. And we go through the entire, or we try to go through the entire seed of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We've nearly finished volume one, and we'll move on to volume two, inshallah. This started actually, this series of lectures started when we had the COVID lockdown. Long, long time ago now, it feels like. Right, Allah removed this uh, difficulty from us, inshallah. But we began the Sira project when, pretty much when the restrictions on the lockdown kicked in. We're hoping, inshallah, with the love and the muhabbat of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that through this, inshallah, through his intercession as well, that all our difficulties are alleviated from us, inshallah. So we're on lecture number 71 or 72. I can't remember, but you can access them that if you've missed them, inshallah. And I'll also record today's lecture, so that will be available as well for those of you who cannot make it. So we briefly talked on Friday about the erection of the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the construction of the masjid of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we talked about how Sahal and Suhail were two orphans from whom the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted to purchase the land, right, to build the masjid. And they, they, they said, look, we just want to give it to you. We don't even want money for this. We just want to give it to you, O Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But the Prophet uh, insisted that they should be paid for that land as well. So Abu Bakr ta'ala purchased the Masjid al-Nabawi for 10 dinars, 10 gold coins. And um, it's beautiful when you think about it, 10 gold coins in those days. And perpetually, every year, all the time, thousands of people come regularly to pray at Masjid Nabi. Imagine how much reward Abu Bakr is getting. The 10 dinars, right, is nothing, right? But until now, even though Masjid is still open, inshallah, when it opens up properly post, post COVID 19, the thousands of people that attend the Masjid Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, imagine how much reward Abu Bakr is getting. Not only was he the one who was Sahib Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi, he was the one who was in the cave with the Prophet. If that's not enough, you know, he's got everything. Why? Because he gave his life for deen. So this is a reward for those who serve Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala's deen. And that's their reward continues even after they leave this world. And so this is Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And so then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam began building the masjid and I talked about how he himself the Prophet himself was involved in the construction of the building. Uh, so he was deeply involved. So this is what you call a leader, not just sitting on the sidelines and giving instructions, but actually rolling his sleeves up and getting involved in the construction of the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I talked about, or we talked about the famous story of Uthman bin Maz'un, who liked to keep his clothes clean. You always have someone in your masjid, in your committee, in your community who likes to look after himself. There's a famous f- funny story about him, which I mentioned as well. And we also made the point that the masjid was known for its simplicity. The masjid was known for its simplicity. It wasn't an extravagant building. It wasn't, um, you know, millions of pounds weren't being spent on it. Right? In fact, we know that the roof, you could reach it. And it used to leak when it was raining. Right? So this is the simplicity of the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then we talked about how he went and uh, he went uh, reconstruction during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as well when it fell into disrepair. So once the masjid was built, next to the masjid there were some rooms built for the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Rasulullah did this straight away for his uh, for Hazrat Sauda bint Zam'a and Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. And then additional rooms were built next to the masjid as the time and the need arose as well. And adjacent to the masjid were the houses of Haritha bin Nu'man Ansari. Right? The Prophet would be offered his house whenever the Prophet needed it. 
whenever the Prophet needed it, he would let the Prophet use his house as well. So in this manner, he offered all his houses to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and most of the rooms were built um, of uh, branches of date palms, and some were built from unbaked brick. Very simple, uh, simple lifestyles. Right? This is the way the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam lived, and the doorways. So they never had fancy doors that we have today, right? They just had a piece of cloth, literally. A thick piece of cloth, which would be a door. Basically, this is the simplicity of the Prophet ﷺ and the early Muslims as well. And so this tells us that they understood that, look, this world is not worth, you know, investing so much time and energy into it. We're going to go anyway, right? These houses are going to come and go as well, just like us. So they never really focused too much on building palaces or anything like this as well. And there wasn't much light. Um, they say there wasn't much light at night as well. They never really used to light things at night. Um, but as one of the shuyukh says, when you need, why do you need light when you have the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam? You have the light of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, metaphorically speaking, or no, even literally speaking, right? Of the Prophet alaihi salatu wasallam. Then why do you need to have fancy lights? Uh, so this is the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right? He was a siraj munir. He is a light, a guiding light, and it's. It's um, it's interesting that we're talking about the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as a means of guide, guidance, as a means of light. When Europe, the so-called liberal, uh, secular world, is immersed in darkness, right? Not physical darkness. Of course, it's dark as winter time. But I mean, look at it. Look at their look at their outlook. It's misery, right? It's misery upon misery. The poor are being disenfranchised. They're not being looked after, right? Our beloved NHS is being just milked. Right, our schools, our teachers are not being given their due. Right, the weakest in society are being mistreated. When at a time when under COVID-19, we should be looking after those people the most. We should be looking after. There was a there's a campaign about feeding poor children. Right, and what do some people say? Oh, their parents, their parents uh, shouldn't be wasting their money on cigarettes and these sort of things. La hawla la Where's our mercy gone? Yeah, they shouldn't be having so many children. I've seen these arguments as well. Yeah. When our deen teaches us to have mercy towards people, yeah. so in a time when people are most in need, what do people do? People who have, who should be responsible, are turning their backs away from them. But the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he's a siraj, he's a means of light. And of course, we've heard about the unfortunate incident with the cartoons once again. This seems to be a regular feature. This idea that you know free speech, uh, we can mock people as we want, and you shouldn't be offended. But, uh, you know, these are, these are debates that are taking place, right? Mockering and mocking people. What's the purpose of mocking people? What do I get by mocking you? Uh, doesn't mean you have to mock people if you have the right to mock people. This is, this is, this is not very good. And this is not what our deen teaches us. And of course, we don't mock them back because this is not the way the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would have wanted us to behave. In fact, we, we learn about his life and we practice his life. So we bring, we bring this light into every house. That did you know that this person that you are mocking is this person that he loved you, he wanted the best for you, he made dua for you, right? He had these beautiful manners, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we have to learn his way and embody his way as well, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So as one of the poets says, Ya badi addalli wal ghanaji laka sultana ala al mahaji. Oh, you with unique and exquisite features, your kingship extends, extends over hearts. Your kingship extends over heart that your home any home wherein you reside doesn't require a light any love any house that has the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa he's being remembered yeah? his ways are being followed we don't need a light in that house right and what does he say uh, your blessed face will suffice for us as a proof the day when people will come to present their proofs. Just your presence on the day of Qiyamah, just you being present there next to me will be enough. Everybody will be arguing their case, but the fact the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will be standing next to you on the day of Qiyamah, we're saying that's enough for us. And so this is important, especially uh, when these people don't understand how beloved the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is to us. Right? He's extremely, we, we, this is something part of our deen that we can't tolerate. You can't mock our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right? We don't do that to anything. We don't we don't mock something that's sacred. We respect people's uh, sacred um, items. 
So in a way, you should respect our Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Uh, so this is something that they do just for fame, just to prove silly points, right? And this is why we as Muslims need to become better at this, uh, rise up and become better people. Uh, not preach hatred, but teach them that, look, we're going to become better than you. Uh, so there's also ironies and all of this, and there's also other issues with all of this, but I'm not going to go into it. But the fact is that France has highest Muslim population in Europe. We make dua for the Muslims because they've been persecuted, right, in the name of secularism and so forth. These are religions. These are deen. This is their deen that they follow. And so they doing this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for all of them. Right? If we, we should let people freely practice their faith. Right? This is part of something that's very, very important to us. So anyway, we learn about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then we learn about um, the demise of his wives. So following the demise of Hazrat Sauda bint Zam'a, for example, um, for, for example, when the Prophet's wives all passed away, when the Prophet himself passed away, I'm just going to jump forward a little bit into the seerah. Um, the rooms which were built during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam under Walid bin Abdul Malik, this is someone that came later on, he actually demolished these homes of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and people were very upset with him when he did this as well. Uh, that uh, you know, people could, you know, the, the people would say that if you just left these rooms, even if nobody slept in them, or nobody used them, we could see how simple the Prophet sallallahu lived. And now on the internet, I think there was a video going viral, a good authentic viral video about how the Prophet room was like. So you can watch that as well. I don't have the link for it. But you can watch it where the Prophet room, what would it have been like in the time when he was there as well. And it was simplicity. Simplicity was the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He was the greatest. He was the one through whom everything was created sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so, during this time when Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was around, when he was in Medina and he was settling into Medina, he sent Zain bin Haritha and Abu Rafi, Abu Rafi to Makkah. So remember, some of the Muslims had still left, were still left behind in Makkah. Not all of them had migrated, all or most of them had did. So he sent for whom? Hazrat Fatima, his daughter. She was the only one of his children that outlived him, and she only lived him, outlived him by a few months afterwards. Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha. And there's a famous story about how he made her laugh and he made her cry simultaneously on his deathbed. But we'll come to that later on, inshallah. So, you know, it's, it's beautiful. A daughter, it was a daughter that survived the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In our culture where sometimes daughters are seen as uh, a misfortune. La hawla wa la illa billah. It was a daughter that survived the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we know how much he loved, he, how much he loved Fatima radiallahu ta'ala. He had immense love for his daughter as well. In some certain cultures, this is quite, I mean, it's becoming less now, but in certain cultures, it's, I mean, I remember when I had my first daughter, I went to a certain area and the family, one of the, one of the sisters said to me, you know, mashallah, Mubarak, what did you have? And this, and this. I said, I had a daughter and she looked at me like, you know, like I'd been punished. And I was like, Alhamdulillah, I've been blessed with a daughter. And then Allah gave me a second daughter. Then Allah gave me a third daughter. Uh, so it's not a problem for me. Alhamdulillah. You know, and daughters bring lots of mercy into your house. And, you know, the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if you do tarbiyah of them, right, so I say to my daughters, you're my keys to paradise. If I look after you three till you get married, because after marriage, you're, you're with your husband. But until then, you're my responsibility. And if I can take care of you for a few more years, yeah, then inshallah, you'll be my keys to paradise. And what more does a father want, right? So Hazrat Fatima, Ummi Kulthum, Ummul Mu'mini, Hazrat Sauda were asked to come back with Zaid and Abu Rafi back to um, uh, Medina to Medina to Munawwara Abu Bakr sent his son Abdullah to fetch as Aisha who was still the daughter of the who was not yet married to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as Asma as the Umm Ruman and Abdul Rahman and Abdul Rahman bin Abu Bakr so he sent he sent for them to be brought to Makkah from Medina to Munawwara as well and by the time Hazrat Zaid bin Haris returned to Medina um, Hazrat Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had already relocated remember from the sea Sira, we talked about how he initially was staying at the house of whom? As Ayyub al-Ansari, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Whose house did he stay at first? Ayyub al-Ansari, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Now he, was, he had moved next to the masjid, uh, the room next to the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So that's where he began to live as well. As Ayyub al-Ansari is not buried in Medina. Where is he buried? Anybody know? Istanbul. Where is he buried? Istanbul. Where's Marina? Where's Istanbul? You tell me. Marina kaha hai? Istanbul kaha hai? Yeah. 
He could have stayed in Medina if he wanted to do the same procedure of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But why did he leave? Uh, the same reason our brothers leave to call people to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. We go in tabliq. Why? They are following his footsteps. Right? They live in the comfort of the home. Who doesn't want to leave Medina? Right? But for tabliq, he runs all the way. He makes hijrah all the way to. Uh, he, he, he's buried. Um, in fact, there's, there's a history behind how his body was found. Nobody knew he was buried there. Then one of the sultans saw a dream or something. Or one of the shuyukh saw a dream and then they found out his grave, his body is buried. And there's a masjid there as well now. If you go to Istanbul, you should visit this place. So Hazrat Ayyub al-Ansari, Ayyub, they call it Ayyub. Right? Ayyub al-Ansari, radiallahu ta'ala, is buried in Istanbul. Subhanallah. Yeah. So this is, you know, he had he had the Prophet stay at his house. Uh, imagine if you had someone like that staying at your house. Subhanallah. Yeah. But then he made hijrah. He, he understood that it's important to spread the deen of Islam, the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the same time as well. So they had no interest in worldly comforts. We'll just end with a little bit of a reflection on the expansion of the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the masjid obviously was expanded. It wasn't expanded the way it is now, right? It's a very simple building. I'm still happy that they keep at least some of the original masjid there. It's still there, a little bit of it still there, despite all the modernization that has taken place. So during the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when he became the Khalif, he didn't really extend the masjid. There was no extension and the Khilaf of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He all, the only thing that he did, the only thing that he did we know of is in the, tr the trunks. We might say the pillars were made out of palm tree trunks, right? He just replaced them because after a while they get wear and tear. That's all he did. So he just did a replacement on them because they decompose with age as well. Then in the seventh year of Hijrah, under the Khilaf of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he extended the masjid forward a little bit towards the Qibla. Right? And the western side of the masjid was extended. Okay, um, So he didn't extend the eastern side of the masjid, which is where the wives of the Prophet were staying. So he just extended the masjid because obviously the ummah was growing and the masjid required an extension. But that's all he did. Then under... Um, and he didn't really bring any like substantial change to the masjid as well. Okay, it, it looked the same pretty much, despite the fact he extended it as well. Um, he also built the masjid with unbaked bricks, um, and then you know he he kept the simplicity of the original structure. So in Abu Bakr Umar, it was kept pretty much the same for all intents and purposes as it was. It wasn't you know a glamorous masjid, and you have to remember I mentioned this on Friday. It wasn't like they didn't have the money. The Muslims were expanding, they were conquering so much land, so much money was coming in. But Medina was just a simple place, right? And then sometimes I ruminate, you know, because I've missed that age when you know you see those black and white videos of Makkah, Medina, you think, oh, I wish I could go then, right? I wish it was go there when you saw just all cars, you know, uh, and people on camels and horses traveling around Makkah, Medina, you think, Allahu Akbar, you know, I wish I could go to Makkah, Medina when it's just simple like this. You know, the only thing I remember is as a child, I went when I was, I wasn't a child, but when I went, I was younger. Um, our hotel used to be literally across the door, door from Babul Umrah. You won't know what Babul Umrah is, but one of the entrances, literally, our, our hotel, you cross the door and you're into the harem. Right? That was that was the only thing I remember. The hotels were all like, they were all like really tightly packed together. Not like the modern hotels today where, you know, it's all glamorous and shiny and someone opens the door for you and, you know, all this. It was... The toilet sometimes never used to work. But the fact was, you were outside the masjid and the Thai alleyways, right? I remember those days. And when we went from, we went as a group from university once, we had summer holidays. So myself, my brother, and one or two friends, we went. We didn't even book a hotel. We just stayed, we just turned up at Makkah. I remember this. We turned up at Makkah. We just left our suitcases by the masjid. Two, three Saudis were looking after the um, luggage. And we just started inquiring. You just walk into the hotel and you just ask somebody, have you got some room? <laughs> have you got some room? Right? It was simple like this before. And then I wonder it was like what it was like before that. I mean, I seen some of the videos. There's still trees around the masjid in Masjid Nabi. There's no trees now. And so this was the simplicity. And only recently, all this modernization has taken place, which has really taken us away from what it would have at least looked like in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the nearest you can get is if you go to um, some of the African countries where they still build houses from baked bricks. So in Morocco, if you go into the desert areas, you'll see what it was like, the oasis towns. So we went to a place... Uh, Sukura in, in Morocco, South Smoke. And you see how it was like then, tight little villages, you know. That's all you can at least think of at the time of the Prophet. So coming to an end, inshallah. So this was time of Umar, nothing been changed. Abu Bakr, nothing been changed. Uthman, he extended the masjid a little bit. 
uh, and he used uh, decorative stones and he used lime as mortar, right? And he remodeled the pillars from stone and replaced the roof using a kind of hardwood timber. So now it became a proper structure under the Khilafah of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And some of the Sahaba were indeed offended by this because everybody is different, right? Even in our community, if you do something to the masjid, you're going to get 20 different opinions. You want to change the wallpaper? One brother will say this, one brother will say, everybody has different opinions, right? You know, somebody says, oh, you should do this, you should do that. Everybody has an opinion when it comes to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when he noticed, Uthman did, that some of the companions were not happy with this, he just, you know, he just mentioned in one of his khutbahs, he just mentioned that, you know, you've made all these comments, right? أَنَّكُمْ أَكْثَرَتُمْ وَإِنِّي سَمِتُ نَبِيَ صَلَى اللَّهُ وَسَلَّمْ I've heard you lot saying, all, I've heard all of these comments. You know, people make these comments on the side while you're walking past, or you hear from second-hand sources that somebody said this about you, what you're doing. So he said, look, I heard the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم saying that مَنْ بَنَا Whoever builds a house for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala يَبْتَغِي بِهِ وَجْهَ اللَّهِ Seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah will build a house for him in Jannah. So he says, I'm doing this for this reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The construction began in Rabiul Awwal, which is the month now, in the 29th year of Hijri, and it reached its completion on the 30th of Muharram. 30th uh, Muharram uh, in the 30th year of Hijri. So roughly 12, 20 months of construction work was taking place. It was quite a project under Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Um, and so people, um, in fact, one of the companions, Ka'ab bin Ahbar, when the masjid was being built under the khilaf of the Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu, uh, he made a dua that, you know, Allah, don't let this masjid construction be completed. He made his dua. So people like, why are you making this dua? Why would you make a dua against the masjid be completed? And he said, he said, once the renovation is complete, the doors of fitna will open. And we know that the first fitna that was to besiege the ummah was under the khilaf, was under khilaf of the Uthman. He was martyred. But Umar was also assassinated. But Uthman was also, and that's when the fitna really, really, maybe later on when we go for the seerah, we'll talk about this, about what happened in the Khilaf of Uthman, what happened to him as well. And so um, not even the companions were saved from those who sought to create divisions in the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But I always say the beauty of our deen, the beauty of our deen is that the fact that we've had these fitnas the fact that companions have been killed and Muslims have been killed and great, great leaders have been killed, our deen pretty much has remained intact. Even in the last two centuries, Muslim rules have been, Muslim countries have been destroyed, decimated. Right? But Alhamdulillah, Muslims are still praying the same salah that the Prophet ﷺ prayed. They're doing the same zakat that he did. They're doing the same hajj that he did. So our core principles in our deen are still there. Nothing's been changed. We haven't changed anything. We haven't watered down our religion. And this is why people find it difficult to understand sometimes. Like these people, they're still following the Prophet ﷺ from that time. Right? They're following his way. They haven't changed anything in their aqidah. They still believe in Allah and his messenger Wasallam. These things haven't changed. We haven't watered these things down. We haven't compromised on these things. We have the same iman, same belief that the Sahaba had. In essence, right? obviously we don't have the maqam. But the way they pray salah, we pray salah the same way. The way we make, everything is the same. Everything is the same. And everything is documented meticulously about them. So this is some. This is what I call love of the Messenger Sallallahu We love him so much that we preserve everything about him. It is as though he's in front of us. It is as though he is with us. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is the love that ulama had for him. May Allah Subhanahu wa Taala make our children like this. So my final advice here, and we'll continue tomorrow, is that as much as possible, we should try and follow the way of the Prophet Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We should learn it, love him and follow his way because to follow him is to love him and we should teach our children about the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam you don't have to sit down for an hour with them five ten minutes about the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa every day there are lovely books that you can get in english now right, sit down don't leave it to the madrasa to do it do it yourself as a parent teach them about the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who he was and how he behaved and just simple things just simple things like you know if someone's sitting in your car mehman's getting in your car Right, teach your daughter or your son that you know when somebody comes to our car, you're gonna get out of the car and give, open the door for them, teaching them the adab. This is what we've lost today. Teaching adab, oh, beta, beta. when someone knocks on the door, open the door for them and welcome them into the house. Ask them, would you like water or tea or something to drink? Teach them basic adab. That when you go to someone, right, when you want to ask someone something and they're reading a book, you don't start shouting at them, you sit down in front of them, right, so the person knows that you're with, but let him finish his paragraph 
and then he will close his book. You teach them. You don't shout at them. You teach them. This is the other. That when mommy and daddy are talking, you stand there. They know you're present. Let them finish their conversation. But when they're talking, don't interrupt them too as well though. Right? Don't start talking with your wife when the child is talking as well. So you teach them other. This is how society functions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give me the topic. Subhanallah bihamdihi. Subhanakallahumma wa humdika. Nashadu la ilaha illa anta astaghfirullah.